Hey guys, this is Wanch Loa. Um, before we get started with the Mesti Zahi discussion with Nua Mauta, I wanted to do two shout outs, okay? Before we get started on that. Uh, number one is gonna be an alternate channel I have called The True Slaps. I'm on there with my best friend, John Quez Rogers, and we cover a wide variety of topics like philosophy, um, politics, social issues, life matters, uh, what should you do with your money, uh, investing strategies, um, you know, commentary on current events, things like that. So if you like me and you like the humor I have, uh, and you, I mean, and you like the dynamic me and Marcus have, well, there's a very similar dynamic I have with John Quez and, and we're pretty informal. It's not like super intellectual stuff. Uh, it, it's just deep discussions, but it's two regular guys just giving their take on a variety of things. So if you want to see more of me and see somebody that's just as cool as me, if not cooler, check out that uh, my channel, The True Slabs. I'm going to have it in the description. And my second shout out is going to be to Curly Tlapoyawa. He has a podcast named um, Tales of Aslantis. His co-host name is uh, Ruben, I believe is the first name, but he has an alternate name he goes by called Tlacateca. He uh, has a doctorate in history. And they bust a lot of myths like the ones um, purported by the Abocentrics who say that the original Native Americans are African Americans, which is completely false, that's baloney. Well, they tackle that sort of stuff. I follow them on Spotify, but they're on a wide variety of platforms. So again, uh, my channel, The True Slaps, follow, uh, subscribe to me on there, and then uh, follow Curly Tlapoyawa on Tales of Atlantis. Thank you. Hey guys, we're now into part two, where we're gonna discuss Mestizaje, Latinx identity, and re-indigenization. On, for Juan Chilo and I, um, we think that you know mestizaje just needs to be put to rest. Yep. And a lot of people that might turn off like a lot of people that are very much pro that, but ultimately, in order for you know our brothers and sisters in North America to get the rights that were broken from them as far as the land treaties, missing indigenous women, and all the other terrible things that have happened, we have to come together in some way. Now, I don't know what your thoughts, I mean, well, I did watch your video with Anthony and like with Masizahe, the, the real Indio is, is the real Masizahe is Indio? Is yeah, the real Mestizo is Indio or the real Mestizo is indigenous. Yeah, so, yeah, so that comment, um, I, I said Indio because um, there is a philosophy called Indianismo in Bolivia and it was created by what could arguably be the um, first or the first major indigenous philosopher in Bolivia, Fausto Reynaga. Um, Reynaga uh, was, um, he had originally been a syndicate, uh, a union leader, and then he had become an intellectual. And he was born in 1905 and had lived through much of the most turbulent periods in Bolivian history, including the... Um, including the war of the war of the Chaco, La Guerra del Chaco, the, um, and the Bolivian revolution of 1952. And he was a vocal, both critic and supporter of the, of the revolution because he had hoped that um, indigenous peoples could actually govern themselves through the revolution. But like much of the national, many of the national revolutions in Latin America, in a similar sense with um, Juan Velasco Alvarado and the Peruvian national revolution of 1968 indigenous peoples didn't govern themselves but they gained many rights including um in some ways land back i think the north american native community can learn a lot if they studied peru and bolivia in the sense of what constitutes land back what are the examples that peru and bolivia show of that happening and what are the the, the failures of those of those land reform movements in which the national revolution, the national governments gave back land to indigenous peoples, but didn't give them enough authority over them. So Indio um, and indigenous, and one of the policies of the national government was uh, Bolivia in the nationalist government was indigenous peoples were no longer indigenous, no longer Indios. They were campesinos, which meant that their ethnic identity, legally speaking, and their racial identity was taken away from them. And that to be properly Bolivian, they were campesinos. Their labor relationship to the nation state was what mattered. So if that's what constituted their own indigenous identity, their, their relationship to labor, that means all of their culture can be stripped away from them. 
including the way in which their labor is formulated through ancestral culture and the way in which Bolivian culture itself constitutes is constituted. It no longer needs the indigenous. They're already liberated. Just like Simon Bolivar, who had in theory removed peonage, indigenous peoples needed to be assimilated to create a proper Bolivia. Um, so Fausto Genaga argued Indio. Indio is the word that was seared onto Boliv onto indigenous peoples and and is the one that holds the most emotional weight. So we're gonna use that as a way to remind people that we're colonized and that we need to decolonize. Um, it's very fiery in that sense. But that's um but the reason why I said the real mestizo is Indian is because indigenous peoples are the ones who actually do mestizaje better than in than actual mestizos. And what do I mean by this? Indigenous peoples already mix their cultures as much as um, mix their cultures. Like they're part of history. So they take on characteristics from the dominant culture and from other cultures that come in. In Bolivian Spanish, sometimes you'll see, you'll have words like, um, you'll have, like my mom and my dad would say like, yeah, there are indigenous peoples in Bolivia who say hi. And I was just like, what? They're like, yeah, they say hi as a greeting. And I was like, that's English. But that's because the English, when they had led many of the mining, many of the mining projects in Bolivia to extract tin for English industries and the world economy, had uh, many indigenous peoples had taken on words like hi or um, how are you? Sometimes they would say, how, uh, wait, Kawari, uh, Kawari you, to say like, how are you? Kawari means look. So, but they would say, Kawari are you? Like, how are you is mixed in with Quechua as a way to pronounce it like an English phrase. So they have, so they speak Quechua, but they also have taken on some English into their own Quechua. They also like the bowler hats the, that the Cholitas wear, that also comes from the English during the early 1900s, late 1800s. They had taken the hat as part of their 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 traditions, as the part of their garb. Um, also, many uh, what was it? Many indigenous peoples are also bilingual. A me, isn't a mestizo someone who is able to fuse both cultures? Then many of the indigenous peoples who are bilingual are the true or people who are able to hold both cultures at the same time. Um, so not only in dress and in speech and not only in dress and slang, but also in the very fact of indigenous peoples being bilingual and already incorporating Spanish words into modern Quechua Naimara, which is very common. There are many words that were popular in colonial Spanish in, in Quechua and Aymara now. And, but in Quechua, but um, so already you have this mixture built into modern indigenous identity. But mestizos, they won't even think, they, they can't even think of the idea of holding an indigenous language. And it's a hypocrisy to say you're, you're a mixed person, you have both cultures, when one of them is absolutely abhor abhorrent for you. So in that way, like, what was it? And in many ways, the cultural, like, the real mestizos, um, some, of the, the, some of the few mestizos, like the indigenistas, actually valued indigenous culture. They would write about it in Spanish and philosophers like Franz Tamayo, D, uh, Fernando Diaz de Medina, Luis I. Balcarcel, Jose Uriel Garcia, and even Jose Carlos Mariategui mixed European ideas with the indigenous ones, which was a big no-no in very intellectual parlance. It was a big no-no for the intellectual class at the time. Indigenous ideas had no place so um, in high in high minded society, which was focused on either French culture, American culture, or the Hispanistas. So in that, so indigenous peoples and the mestizos who started to re-indigenize themselves, like the indigen like the early indigenistas, are the true representatives of what it means to do mestizaje, because they were the ones who are able to mix. Um, they're able to mix Spanish culture, language onto indigenous ideas or onto indigenous languages that already exist. And if you're not able to do that, 
then you're not a really a mestizo. What you are is um is a white is a is in this case of um the Franz Fanon's uh, Franz Fanon's book Black Skins White Mask. You're a brown skin with a white mask. You're a brown person who plays who wants to be white. And in a similar sense, indigenous peoples, there is no mestizo in that sense. Being indigenous already implies that you can mix cultures in. The, and the, the worry is that if you say that there's a mestizo who is able to fuse cultures and there's an indigenous person who keeps the culture pure, it means indigenous peoples don't exist in history. They can't exist in history. Purity is outside of history. It never changes. But indigenous peoples have changed. Right. See, that, that's that's one thing I've noticed is like people, they don't apply this strict criteria, like all the pro hispanistas like the pro mestizaje people, they don't apply this strict criteria to any other group on the planet. Like, the, like everybody else changes with centuries, yeah. right? They change with decades. The culture changes. Everything changes. But with the, but in, in their stupid view, for you to be indigenous, you must be completely 100% pure like 500 years ago and nothing could have changed. If anything changed and somehow you're mestizo, you're not that same thing. It's like, how does that make any sense? If, if the Spaniards, if the English, if every, everybody under the sun can change, so can indigenous people. So you don't have to be 100% pure in the culture or know the language or do this and that. Like to, like that's what that's what I think is silly. Like is like these people don't apply consistent logic to things, and that's the main thing me and Marcus attack. It's like you you can't use inconsistent logic. It has to be consistent all across the board for you to make sense and for you to have something to stand on. So that's the point I make. Um, like a lot of the a lot of the times I just use the racial arguments. Like I'm like if I'm mestizo, well then black people in the United States aren't black. They're 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 mulattoes. They're all mulattoes. They're not black. It's like, but nobody says that because that sounds preposterous. It sounds asinine, right? Exactly. You know, and that's a similar way. There's a there's a strange argument that's made amongst um, some some Latinxes that is the, uh, which is you can't be indigenous because you're born outside of an indigenous community. In that way, you're appropriating indigenous culture by doing what you're doing. But in a similar vein, you could say, and it's a very racist argument. Like, and I don't mean that to be hyperbolic. It is actually very, um, it is highly discriminatory, because that standard does not, uh, that standard wouldn't apply. That standard would be completely alienate that uh, would completely alienate any immigrant group from their own communities. You could say that from someone who's uh, from any other group saying, you're not, you weren't, you were born in the U.S. You were born outside of your home country. And for that reason, you can't actually be Asian. You can't be you can't be black. You can't be um, not. You can't even be Latin American in that sense, because maybe right. you were, maybe you were born in the suburbs or maybe you were born in a in a white community. To say that it would be sim similar to, you can't be black. You were born in a white neighborhood. It's absurd. Right. That's yeah. Ex exactly. Or I, I even take it a step further. I'm like, with the black thing, I'm just like, okay, well, black people don't speak an African language. They don't have African names. Uh, they don't know what African tribe they come from. They didn't grow up in an African community. Does that mean that they're not black? Anymore? And that create, and they're able to create um new and uh, new black identities, philosophies, cultures. But that type of menta uh, but that type of mentality creates a very violent view of indigeneity and one that repeats colonial aspects of indigenous peoples are always you can't be indigenous which implicitly plays into the idea that indigenous peoples are will always disappear which is helpful for the for colonizers because the less indigenous peoples there are the less problems there are of oh we need to quell indigenous peoples who keep questioning our nation states or oh these indigenous peoples keep making claims to land and they're right because they've existed here from time immemorial and that, but it is a very, and it's a very, and it's disheartening because it comes from a progressive community that is trying to do its best. They're trying to say your personal experiences um, are what matter. Those personal experiences are very much true, but there's also the collective memory, which is what goes into your own ethnic identity. Literally, you can't, like, being a Bolivian means you have a certain view that you partake in the national history of Bolivia. If you don't have that collective memory, there is no Bolivian, which means that if you're only working on your own personal identity, you can't, you're, 
if you take it to a logical extreme, you literally can't be part of any community. You can't be part of a national community because you're, you're just an individual. Right. And, that, and that creates a problem for every, for every racial, ethnic, um, social group. And it's a very problematic one and it has, race, and it has racist implications when you, uh, when you say that to indigenous peoples. They just don't know that because somehow they haven't met indigenous peoples who are willing to argue against them on that. Right, right. Um, one, one point we've come up on is like, which I think is really silly, is uh, when people like, especially on the left, they'll be saying, well, you're speaking over indigenous peoples. Or you're, you know, it's, it's always that line, which I think is silly because it's like you're acting like you know what every single indigenous community would say on this matter. Um, like my, my indigenous community, the Guachichil, they absolutely want descendants back. They want all the mestizos back to return to, to who they are and to embrace being Guachichil instead of being Mexican, instead of being mestizo. They want Guachichils, right? So them actually saying, oh, no, you're speaking over indigenous communities. Well, they're speaking over my indigenous community. So who's really at fault here? Yeah, it's, 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 it's ironic. They say this stuff, but yet they're doing the same thing. They're accusing me of it's silly. And at that point, what constitutes an indigenous person? Mm. And that become because someone like me, I may be mestizo, but my dad speaks Quechua. My grandpa is indigenous. My grandma, my, uh, my grandma from Bolivia, uh, my paternal grandma, she's indigenous, she's Quechua. So what does that make me? Am I, should I be just because I was born here? Does that mean I should give up my cultural identity to fit within a, uh, within a narrative, within a narrative that actually supports mm, colo uh, the colonial erasure of indigenous people? I think that's one argument that needs to be made. And it's made by people who, the argument that that type of like, oh, you like you're speaking over indigenous people, it comes from a good place, but it's it's no different from the condescension and the paternalism that existed among some of the assimilationist indigenistas. Oh, you can't keep your language, you can't keep your culture. It's what's making you poor. We're going to help evolve your culture through education, through um, through government programs that'll little by little erase your culture, but it'll make your life better. In the sense, in the sense of saying, your life will be better now. Um, your life will be materially better because you're de-Indianizing. In a sim, in that similar paternalistic way, uh, we're helping you be take care of indigenous peoples by keeping the descendants from having their culture back. And also, it keeps uh, it means that indigenous peoples can't have new experiences of their own indigenous identity. There can never be an indigenous person in New York. There can never be a Quechua in New York because I'm I'm away from the Andes. Right. When in reality, it's just I'm being a Quechua in New York and have a different experience of Quechua identity because of that. And it's a and what was it? And it's also it also feeds into a very racist argument that indigenous peoples are only country are only folks from the countryside that exist in a very specific relationship. Um, uh, to uh, to nature, and is that and that specific relationship to nature is somehow and becomes romanticized, and it's just like not true. You have everyone from Evo Morales to like, um, who became president to, um, Aymara intellectuals in like El Alto and La Paz, which are cities, and they become Aymara cities. But to a lot of these um to a lot of progressive Latinxes who have these who hold these into these uh, paternalistic views on indigenous on indigeneity. In the urban Indians don't exist to them. They can't exist. And if they don't identify as indigenous, who are they to speak as well on this matter? Right, right. Um, yeah, I just think, yeah, it, and it is racist because, I mean, this, it goes in line with the Mexican government view on indigenous people, which is yeah. in order to, like, the, like, you know, you have the American government, the U.S. government that has their own requirements, which are actually very loose compared to the Mexican government standards. The Mexican government says, uh, you have to grow up in an indigenous community. You have to continuously live the life of an indigenous person. Uh, I don't know if they literally say you have to be 100%, but they probably do. Um, but basically, if you're an indigenous person in an indigenous community and you leave the community, you go to the city, then somehow you're not indigenous anymore. You're a mestizo now. That's, what, that's how the Mexican government views things. 
So it's like very racist because it limits everybody. You can never, indigenous people can never grow beyond this little box that they've been sh- uh, shoved into. If they, if they leave this little box and somehow they are not indigenous anymore. Exactly. I will say that like having language is an important part of that indigenous identity wherever you live. Um, like because indigenous languages hold a worldview, it, it, they have their own philosophies and culture and way of viewing the world that's completely different from the West in many cases. But it's also that even people who don't have the language and who live in, who live outside of the community, they have as much a right to that specific identity as anyone else. And I mean, what was it? And this is a process that goes back to, and th- this is um, a divide between two types of indigenismo. There's like a radical indigenismo, which was like indigenous peoples rise up and, and take control of your lands back, uh, and take control of the government and your land back because this is your land. And the other indigenismo, the paternalistic one of, we're going to assimilate indigenous peoples to be proper mestizos. Both of them are technically indigenismo. Um, but like that government policy is the one is one that has existed across Latin America. And it's one, and it plays the same role as blood quantum does in the U.S. of trying to erase indigenous peoples, because we constitute a problem for nation states to exist. In the mind of Latinx folks, um, it it also shows a flaw within their own idea of Latinx identity, that somehow like um, there's the mestizo who's the brown Latinx. Then you have the black, uh, then you have Afro Latinx, and then you have white Latinxes. In no way are indigenous peoples represented in that. And I think it shows a problem with the intellectual culture that's developed. And it is very much influenced by like, um, it could be influenced by like the Mexico centric view of a lot of Latinxes, but also um, their uncritical stance towards decolonization and maybe even fear of being indigenous as well. There's always that. Yeah. Um... One point to add on to that was I remember I was listening to a certain channel and these people that very much opposed, you know, indigenous unity, any form of um, indigenista. And what they believed was that us who they consider like mestizos are only claiming to be indigenous so that we can get some sort of rights and benefits um, in the US. And the fact that they said that we were mixed so we can't be indigenous. I was like, that's the stupidest argument I've ever heard. I would really like to dismantle this this person's argument, by the way, in person. I would love to. Um, (laughs) Don't worry, I got you. Thank you. And because we look at the United States, and I I brought this up, I don't know if it got aired or not, but well, aired, put on our channel, was that if you look at the videos on YouTube of, you know, Native American tribes and and the, the interviews that they have with certain members, there are some that are obviously not a hundred percent, you know, pure Native American. Yeah, you've got those that look a few that don't look Native at all. No offense to them, but they're very much light skin to the point where they can assimilate into a, a very much white society. Um, and yet, for people south of the U.S. border, we cannot be Native or Indigenous because we hold Spanish blood. Therefore that invalidates our reason. It's quite silly, isn't it? But it's so weird because they will say, like they, Spanish blood is a disqualifier, yet English and French and any other blood under the sun that's white is not a disqualifier. And it and it calls into question, what is so special about Spanish blood that makes it so, so it just changes everything. It's like a, this magical potion. <laughs> like what, what's so special about it? Magical potion. It, there's a there's a rear um, there's a certain relativism that's held that like mestizo identity is legitimate because it is a big part of Latin American identity, but it's but it's absurd. There are there have been critiques in Latin America itself saying that mestizaje doesn't exist. That philosopher Fausto Genaga, whenever he would make whenever he would claim that Bolivia is fully indigenous, he would say it's ninety five percent indigenous. Now what does that mean? That can't mean that like there are only 5% mestizos and everyone's a pure indigenous person. That'd be a lie. What he was saying in his own philosophy in the Indianismo, and I believe it's in his famous book, La Revolución India, is that 
indigenous peoples, mestizos are also indigenous peoples as much as indigenous peoples. They just have to re-indigenize. Um, one of the things that's um, very interesting is that the re-indigenization topic that's um, being discussed among like indigenous activists now in the U.S., uh, that's been a discussion in Mexico, Bolivia, and Peru for a while. Um, actually, the one of the most famous philosophers, Guillermo Bonfil Batalla, in his book, Mexico Profundo, and I, and I recommend every, not just every Mexican, but every Latin American should read that book. There's, there's even a translation in English. Um, Mexico Profundo was written by an anthropologist who himself was influenced by Fausto Jenaga, who was Bolivia's premier indigenous philosopher. And he said, and he wrote that, uh, what was it? There are two Mexicos. There's the imaginary, and then there's the deep Mexico, the real one. And the imaginary one is, is one that is always alienating itself from its own indigenous culture. It's one that's never connected to community. It's one that's never con that always disconnects itself from its history. And it's one that always fetishizes its own relationship to European countries. Whereas the deep one, the real one, is the one that's indigenous, the one that was Mexico be Mexican before it was Mexico, the one that had all of the indigenous cultures that make up, um, that make Mexico completely unique from every other culture. Um, and he would, and one of his famous quotes about this imaginary Mexico was that there is an anxiety that uh, Mexicans feel that their indigeneity is just that they can't escape their indigeneity, that it's skin deep, that literally indigenous peoples, um, the brownness that many Mexicans hold as mestizo reminds them that they're indigenous and no matter, and mes and I would argue that mestizaje is not a mixing of cultures, but it's a, it's a flight. It's an escape from indigeneity. It's a, it's a movement. It's not a state. It's not a static type of being. It's literally a move away from indigeneity. And it's the opposite of indige of indigenizing, which is a move back to being indigenous. And he would argue that even if you're trying to be mestizo or even completely Europeanize yourself, there's the reminder is on your arm. The reminder is your mirror telling you, you can't escape how the world will see you. You can't escape that you will be indigenous to Europeans, no matter how much, how much French, German, um, Latin that you know. Right. Um, a lot of times, like I've like really argued with a lot of these Hispanistas and they, uh, they attack me and they're like, well, you're like half white or whatever, which I mean, yeah, it's true. I'm like almost half white. Right. But I'm like, I'm like, yeah, but come here to Alabama. <laughs> and see and see that where that's going to get you because i grew up here in alabama let me i might as well as be 110 percent in <laughs> indigenous the way i get treated here man like so it's like and so i grew up with that like so for me like the it's just so foreign when i see a lot of people that are my color and they're like oh but i'm i'm half white i'm a stiesel and i'm just like dude like how, do you not see how you're treated here in the United States? Why do you want to make this assertion that you're part white? Well, yeah. why, what does that get you? It doesn't get you anything. There's so. an, you want to say something? Oh, no, I finished. Oh, okay. Um, there's this, um, the discussion around police brutality is actually very important. And people, and it's an indigenous issue as much as it is a quote Latinx issue. The reason why indigenous like Latinxes are racialized the way they are and are so easily brutalized by by the police or by like law enforcement is because whether or not you speak Spanish or whether or not like they view you as like they know which like country you're from, the first thing they see is your skin and your features and your non-whiteness. But where does the non-whiteness come from? You can say, oh, it's because I'm mixed. They don't see you. It's you can be mixed, but you're mixed with what? It's literally that your non-whiteness stems from your indigeneity. And whether or not you identify as indigen as um, as Latinx, as mestizo, as light-skinned Mexican or light-skinned Latin, uh, Central American or uh, South American, your indigeneity follows you and allows you to be viewed in a racialized way that where the where like law enforcement, the education system, 
uh, the government can say, you're lesser than. Your Latinidad is dangerous because of your indigeneity. And there are white Latinos, like there are white Latinxes. They're from Argentina, but they don't receive the same treatment because they're white, because their whiteness is called into question when they speak. And even then within Latin America, they're just white. They're not Latinxes. They're not white Latinxes. They're white from South, right. South America. So yeah, the like um anyone who like most people who are persecuted in the US who are Latinx are done or have that because their indigeneity is skin deep. It's inescapable. And it's also in their features and like how distant from whiteness you are, so, uh, from white you are, which is why like you're absolutely right. Like you gotta just be straightforward and be like, yeah, my experience is literally like no matter how mixed I am, I'm not I'm not white Alabaman. Uh, Alabama. Yeah. yeah, I'm not I'm not white like yeah, so it's just yeah, I I just been mind boggled because I mean not everybody grows up with the same experiences, but like a lot of times I like think, oh yeah, a lot of people think the way I do, but it's like no, I grew up kind of unique here in Alabama and I was illegal for a lot of years on top of that, so it made it even worse. But um yeah, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm oh you want to say something? Oh, sorry. No, please. What were you going to say? Um, that's why I like the um, argument of we're not illegals. We're indigenous to this continent. That's I, why that hits home a lot for me, because I was always called illegal trash. You know, where's your green card? All this. So that's why to me, it's like, I just think it's like for everybody else, it's like you guys are indigenous. Like if you want to giving that up for Misty Zaka for being I'm part white, like it's insane. Like why would you want to do that? You're giving up away gold. Like the, the fact that we're indigenous is gold. Like that we're not foreigners. And like, believe me, being treated like you're foreign scum all your life is not like you, you don't want that. Like, and that's how I've been treated for many, many years. Exactly. And I think it shows um, something very important about how indigeneity is um, formulated. Now indigenous peoples are taking on a, a continental uh, consciousness in the sense that, they're no longer viewing themselves as, oh, we're separated by like these nation states, these borders that like, um, that constitute our identity in the sense that like, not, I, I may be indigenous, but I'm American first. There is the, there's now this view that indigenous peoples, no matter where, which country you're from in the Western hemisphere, in Abya Yala, as many people say, uh, is your, wherever, whichever country you're from, there's always the same condition or similar condition of colonialism that's just repackaged based on which country you're from. But the formula is the same, the dressing's different. And, and it's always, indigenous peoples are a problem for the nation state, they're always criminalized, they're always um, causing problems, they're always in the worst conditions. And their territories, if every time they claim it, makes it a problem for us to not only constitute the land, but use it properly, but use it quote properly for development. So they need to disappear. Either we assimilate them, and we assimilate them, or we straight up exterminate them. In this case of like, um, and it's crazy that this comparison isn't made more, but the boarding school system in the U.S. is similar to the assimilation practices by like, by either by both the indigenistas and the missionary schools in Latin America that you had to learn Spanish, that you had to give up your indigenous ways of living, that to be part of Bolivia and Peru and Ecuador and Guatemala, Mexico, you had to give up, the education system forced you to give up all of these practices in the same way that the boarding schools try to erase your, uh, try to erase indigenous identity in North America. And that compares, and the, the process, the process is similar, but the results, the, the process is similar, the results are similar, but the, the purpose is the same. English or Spanish, you're trying you're trying to raise the native. You're literally killing the Indian to save the man, but in Spanish. And one last thing, um, I I want this quote to go viral, but like, if you want to see a real like what a real indigenous person, um, what the real goal of the boarding school is, you look at them um, in the in the U.S. or in Canada, you go to Latin America and you see how mestizos hate on other indigenous peoples. And they can be the same skin tone. That's literally that's literally the goal of the boarding schools and of assimilation in the U.S. and, and Canada. That you would hate 
the traditional indigenous peoples because now you're an educated one. Now you're a white, now you're a culturally white one. Now you're a quote mixed. And the project is much more complete than Latin America than we'd like to admit. Right, like, like um, I don't know, like my family's never really thought about this topic very much because they're, they're really like, we've been really assimilated, especially up in the Northern Mexico, uh, culturally mm -hmm. speaking and all and identity wise. But uh, they know that I identify as indigenous and I found my tribe and got accepted and stuff. Um, they probably think I'm a weirdo or something, but. <laughs> but um, My family does too sometimes. They think I'm too indigenous. Too indigenous? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> even, even them, like, um, even though I'm reconnecting with the culture, they're like, you may want to tone it down a little. I'm like, no, this is mine because this is ours. <laughs> yeah. No, but like my, like, like my, my dad, like, is like, bro like he's like almost black as far as skin tone like indigenous indigenous bro yeah. and like it's just kind of odd it's like he uh it's not like he hates it anymore or anything it's just in the past he actually used to be kind of like that where he would like hate on others like he would call him indio but it's like you look like you're 100 percent, bro yeah uh, so i don't know i just think it's odd it's like he i don't know how he feels like he sees his son and i'm like basically 50 percent, and here he is like almost 100 and it's kind of like I'm, I'm basically kind of leading the way a little bit. I'm like, hey, let's go back to that. That's that's a beautiful thing. So I don't know, it's kind of odd, I guess, the dynamic. Yeah, there's a little bit of absurdity to it, but I like the US model a bit more. Like, not the blood quantum, but what a lot of activists are saying, that your skin tone isn't what makes you indigenous. Literally, um, your skin tone is used as a way to... Um, view uh, like how much blood you have and like how close to indigenous you are and for a lot of indigenous tribes and nations that are uh, mixed with or mixed up African slaves and then um or like black natives or mixed with a lot of white, white folks so they're very light-skinned so the culture sometimes diluted from indigenous from the and i mean and now there's like a lot of um amongst a lot of indigenous activists that your indigeneity isn't for isn't based on your skin tone but based on your and more of what being indigenous means uh, have the same mentality as someone straight out of a boarding school or straight out of a uh, straight out of like a prep school in Lima. They have the same process. You just hate the Indian because they're beneath you. Um, but yeah, skin tone doesn't represent indigeneity. It's community. It's your genealogy. It's that you descend from it, and you can and you should take pride in it. But that doesn't. I don't support no Cherokee princess here, but. Yeah, yeah, that, that is that's true too. That's true too. Um, yeah, because I've had like I've had some people ask me. They're like, "Well, at one point, do you like draw the line?" And I'm, I always answer with, "Hey, I, I don't know where I draw the line." As in, like, you're not indigenous. I don't know if it's not for me to say if you're twenty percent. That's not enough. That's not for me to say. Obviously, there gets a point where you're so you're basically have zero percent, and obviously you're not indigenous anymore, right? Yeah. Uh, eventually, there's that point. But what I, me and Marcus have always argued on this channel is like what we argue strongly is if you are close to half or 50, like it shouldn't be a question. That's our main argument that we, we've used basically because like, like the vast majority of people fall under that category anyways. Yeah, so. I think I, I'm not going to go like um, go with like a strict percentage like that. I, personally speaking, I think if you look indigenous, if you have those features, it's very noticeable, even on like the lighter skin folk, like that should, it shouldn't be a question that it, that constitutes your indigeneity. If at the very least, your Latinidad, like white Latinxes are not overly criminalized as indigenous descendant Latinxes are. And that shows something about the way your Latinx identity is formulated, that there's something about you that's different from white Latinxes that makes you um, discriminated against. And it's not yeah. that you're, it's not that you're just brown. It's that your brownness comes from your indigeneity. 
and it comes from that it comes from the ancestors who spoke indigenous languages or it might straight up come from your grandma that like spoke quiche kachikel uh, mom uh, quechua mapuche uh, mapundung uh, any like guarani any sort of like indigenous language but and that genealogy also uh, also shows like there are so many people with their grandparents who are who speak an indigenous language and maybe nothing else is that not enough for you to consider yourself indigenous what makes the change and it's not that you somehow become lighter skinned or whiter being in the us it's just that there's a process it's just that you forget the culture and no one is there to remind you that hey that culture matters it doesn't just evolve it's not that you're evolving it's that you're just pushing that to the side needlessly yeah one thing i always found funny about this whole um like mestizaje thing is like how it's not obvious for some people that it's a white supremacist creation because uh you like it's very easy to stop being indigenous but it's like but according to all these people like you have to you have to end world hunger in order to become indigenous again. You know, it, it's, it's designed to where you can't be indigenous again. That's what's ridiculous. And, and, and that's, it doesn't even need to be said. It's obvious for anybody with, with eyeballs to be able to see this, but. Yeah. And there are academics who write about this. Um, people should look up Eve Tuck and K. Wei Yang's article, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor. That article is basically the cream of the crop for most indigenous intellectuals. And it's, argues that and one of the arguments is that indigeneity indigeneity and blackness in a the critical race like a critical race analysis of like blackness and indigeneity shows that blackness was there's the one drop rule of blackness that one black uh one bit of black blood makes you makes you black because during um during the colonial period they needed and before the, the civil war they needed more black folks to work the, to work the plantation, so it created a labor. It created a continuous labor force in which pure whiteness, um, in which only pure whiteness could escape being uh, like being a slave. Whereas um, for ind- and it allowed for a lar- for an ever increasing labor force to exist on the plantation of uh, slaves that will always like more and more black slaves. Whereas for indigenous peoples. The more indigenous people there were, the more the less likely white settlers would gain their lands. So there was the opposite rule that indigeneity was constantly receding. That if you passed 50%, you're no longer indigenous. You pass 25%, you're no longer indigenous. You pass 10%, you're no longer indigenous. And because of exterminate, because of genocide, and because of the erasure, and because people are pushed off their lands, because of the um because of maybe the proximity towards with like other communities, the the idea that indigeneity is ugly or is the opposite of anything good, um, you reject your own indigeneity, and then move out to the cities and forget your culture. Or because you married a white person, because some sometimes you just love someone who's you just love someone, somehow your kid no longer can no longer officially be indigenous which means that the government doesn't have to allot you land like in the Dawes Act, even though the Dawes Act was a colonial, um, was a colonial project to individualize um, indigenous land ownership instead of collectivize it. Even then they didn't want to allot you any land. So making, so making sure that the standards were high meant that they didn't need to give you more reservation land or make sure you could claim that land anyways. And it would allow the government to take that land, make it federal, and then sell it off to either corporations or use it for its own need. And also just not have the problem of the, quote, merciless Indian savage. So it's, an, it's, a, it's a documented academic theory as well. And like, it's a very violent one. And it's one that's existed and it's one that exists not just in the U.S., but it's continent wide. I like how you said uh, when I was watching your video with Anthony, you were discussing like the for us to you know be native or you know reindigenize, we must meet up with this uh, native on the mountain. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> I love to that check metaphor. Us to make sure that we pass, this is some test. 
that's no different from like looking for a Bureau of Indian Affairs agent and being like, am I indigenous? Get the stamp. Yeah, here's your ID card. It's no different. <laughs> just It's just a nice paternalism for some parts of the, for some like very colonialist woke, uh, woke people. Yes, I would agree. Um, I had one final part here before we wrap up. Um, and that was continental indigeneity. Yeah, indigeneity. Indigeneity. Again, I, I do apologize. I don't use that word a lot. Um, but I do practice what is involved here um, a lot in my head. So my question to you is, you know, I, I also see the benefits of a united, you know, indigenous you know, nation such as, you know, Ecuador, Bolivia, Peru. But the three steps major steps for that to, to happen in my belief is that one you know obviously I, I don't know what the thoughts are on native tribes in South America are on their view of you know the so-called you know mestizo wanting to re-indigenize again yeah so having the approval of such tribes two would be the step of obviously abandoning Mr. Zahe altogether. Three would be, and I'm not sure what your thoughts on this, would be to get getting rid of our names, our, uh, our national names of Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador to, to, to merge into one, you know, indigenous, you know, pro-Incan nation. Yeah. Well. Which is a uh, lot to answer yeah. in one. Yeah. Wait, give me a sec. So, in, uh, what was it? Indigenous identity in Latin America, in like South America, um, it's complicated, but there are folks and philosophers who are who argue against Mestizaje, and it's not unusual. But there's also, uh, what was it? But when I think about like people who don't want you to claim indigeneity, there are philosophers literally like Fausto Jenaga. And there was, um, I made this um, IG post where he made a dialogue in one of his books claiming that um, it, between, a, between like an archetypal, typical mestizo and an archetypical indigenous person, he calls him Indio, um, where he says, where the indigenous person tells the mestizo, why don't you come back to indigeneity? And it's literally Falso Jenaga's voice through this um, through this dialogue saying, "Why don't you mestizo re-indigenize yourself?" Written in nineteen seven, and the book was written in like nineteen seventy seven, and the mestizo was like, "Because I fear my indigeneity, because I think you're because I because I view myself as European, uh, more European, even though I'm even though I'm cursed to be somewhat indigenous and mixed." I love Europe more than I love the indigenous side or the indigenous Americas. And, but that dialogue speaks the truth that indigenous peoples will like, um, like Fausto Jinaga will accept you into indigen into indigeneity. It's not something that's like, you have to find the Indian on the mountain. Literally, if you want to find the Indian on the mountain, the wise philosopher, he's right there. He wrote a book. He wrote 30 books actually. Um, it's just that people haven't read it. But in terms of like, what does that mean for the nation state? Does that mean that the nation state continues to exist? There are full indigenous philosophers that say, yeah, the indigenous, the nation state needs to exist, but it needs to exist differently. There is um, many indigenous activists advocate for the plurinational model, which is the more moderate indigenous position in that the nation state remains, this, it remains um, needs a new constitution it could be Mexico, it can be Bolivia, it can be Peru, it could be Argentina. But that constitution recognizes itself as having multiple indigenous um, nations that have a direct relationship with the national government, but also has autonomy to so it can maintain its own culture, its own poli political structure, and its own traditional ways of thinking. So in some ways... Um, it no longer becomes a nation state. It is a plurinational state, a, a state that holds many nations. So Bolivia is, an, is a state that has 36 nations, not including Afro-Bolivians, Mestizo-Bolivians, white Bolivians, or the many immigrant populations in Bolivia. 
or in the case of Peru, there are 54 indigenous nations, not include, uh, and then like Afro natives and, uh, and uh, Afro Peruvians. And if Castillo wins and constant and like um, calls for a plurinational constitution, there would be 50, there would be like 55, 56 indigenous nations or like nations, most of them indigenous in Peru. So it's no longer the old European idea of one people, one, one state, one people, one nation. It's many people in one state. That's one position. Interesting. And, and it was the position of the Zapatistas. There are, and then there are even radical, more radical ones. Uh, people like uh, Felipe Quispe in Bolivia, who said, we need to just straight up give up on Bolivia, take it uh, like, uh, and re-indigenize it and say, I forget what the exact title was. Back in 2019, he said, we need to, we need to destroy Bolivia with Coliasuyu. Coliasuyu is the traditional name of the of Bolivia and the south of, um, of the Inca Empire. That the indigenous side will uh, will reconquer back Bolivia, and change its name and change its whole political structure and 100% indigenize it. Of course, he was like a hardcore militant. The man was crazy, but the man got results. But those are the two sides, and he was somewhat opposed to the plurinational. Um, he was he he became opposed to the plurinational project after he realized it didn't go far enough. Not necessarily because of its theoretical application, but because the way Evo Morales and the mass government and the concessions it made with the right wing, as well as um, maybe its own. It, maybe itself not wanting to move too far on the decolonial side didn't recognize autonomy as much as just as much as it should have but there are those two sides either make it plurinational or straight up 100% indigenize it in the case of Guatemala it would be Ishimule in um, Mexico you can some people say Anahuac um, Canada and the US it'd probably be like a confederation of like indigenous nations or whatever or in Argentina and Chile, those would be split from the half, from the bottom half, and become Wild Mapu. So there are projects like that. Yes. Or theories at the very least. I think we could discuss that more on a different video because we loved having you on. Oh my gosh, I feel like we could yeah. <laughs> we could we could have multiple videos, man. This was I'd love to be recurring. Oh this please, no. Yeah, yeah, for, for sure. Um, and a lot of these books that you're that you're mentioning, I'm gonna try to make a point to buy them and, and read them up because uh like a lot of people like I've run into a lot of people that argue online, they're like, Oh well, people south of the border and like you know, people in Latin America, they don't they don't think the way you guys do. You guys only think this way because you're from the US. But uh that's completely wrong because you have all these philosophers and indigenous people that are writing about this, so yeah, if I recommend one book for English speakers, uh, All right. any, like any, like every indigenous person from North America, Latin, um, Central America, South America has got to read this. It's called The New World of Indigenous Resistance. It's an anthology written by Noam Chomsky, uh, th that was written and collected by Noam Chomsky and two other anthropologists. And it collects writings by indigenous activists and pro-indigenous anthropologists across Latin America. And you have philosophers like Luis Macas, Felipe Quispe, um, Jaime, what was it? Jaime Luna Martinez, the indigenous, uh, indigenous peoples who are arguing against the colonial model that Mexico, Ecuador, Peru, all, con uh, all uh, formed that all try to have the same model of erasing indigeneity. And it's the book that I think influenced me first and the most. Um, in my intellectual journey of re-indigenization and of having a decolonial view of the world. So that was called The New World of Indigenous Resistance? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. It's, a cheap, I'll it's a cheap book too. It should be only 12 bucks, but it's it's worth every penny. If there's only one book I can recommend, I say this with all of my heart, Tukuy Sunkoi one, it's that book. All right. I'm, uh, I'm going to get it. Thank you, man. No problem. Thank you very much. But... um. You know, like I said, we will have to have you on again multiple times. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, for sure. Uh, this is going to be really educational because a lot of, like you said, on our podcast, we focus so much on Mexico, Mexico, Mexico. But a lot of people don't know 
much about these countries south of the, uh, like in South America, like Bolivia and Peru. I mean, I don't, I didn't know a lot of the history. I read up on some of it, but there's a lot, whole lot more I need to learn. So it's good to have you on because uh, people will be able to learn that too. Yeah, I would love to. And I, I'd love to just talk about um, after the Peruvian elections, I'd love to talk about like the implications of, the, of Castillo if he wins. Oh, yeah. Uh, maybe there's a plurinational constitution there or just talk about South America. I, I, I like what was it? I'm trying to work on some posts for on Argentina and Chile because that history is absolutely wild. And the violence that like the Mapuches are facing and all of the indigenous nations that they're mm. facing, it's incredible. And South America just doesn't get enough um, talk about.